excited about this group. Like I said, first of all, just the ones that are staying with us, uh, Mike Bobo, uh, very thankful that we were able to, to keep Mike. It's no secret that when he came to South Carolina, he had other options out there besides the University of South Carolina when he came last season. And this year is, is no different. Proven SEC coordinators uh, that have a track record of success are hard to find. And when you've got a guy like Mike Bobo uh, on your staff, uh, you certainly want to keep him around. I've known Mike for a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was coaching at Virginia Tech with my dad, we actually tried to hire Mike as our offensive coordinator. Uh, this would have been probably 2013, I believe, uh, to the point where we sent a plane to Athens, Georgia uh, to pick him up that he uh, never got on. He had a hard time leaving Athens, which I certainly understand. But he's a guy that I think a lot of uh, as a person, as a recruiter, uh, as a human being. I love his family. And so thankful that, that he's staying here with us. If, if Mike had not been on the staff at South Carolina when I got this head coaching job, he would have been my first call as offensive coordinator. I mean, I think that much of him. You look at what he did at the University of Georgia and his track record of success for a long, long time. Uh, it speaks for itself. Uh, what he did at Colorado State uh, with their offense speaks for itself. And then the fact, I mean, not to make excuses for him, but he came into a tough situation in Columbia. New system, no spring practice, COVID, an unusual summer, an unusual season. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, won't, I'm not going to hold that against him. And, and you look at what South Carolina did this season running the football, and we're excited about what we'll be able to do going forward, uh, uh, adding to that. You know, people, I hear people say, well, his offense is completely different than what you did at Oklahoma. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Anybody that says that probably hasn't watched Oklahoma play a lot of football this year. Uh, people hear air, air raid in Oklahoma and think that we throw it around 70 times a game and we're going up tempo and all that stuff. And that's not us at all. Uh, Oklahoma's offense has set records year in, year out. And we've done it actually running the ball more than we've thrown it the last five years. I don't know what the stats are this year. I haven't seen it, but uh, I know going into the season, we had run it more than we had thrown it. Uh, people say we, Mike Bobo uses a fullback. Well, so does Oklahoma. We call it an H-back to make it sound fancier, but it's the same thing. And uh, we do a lot with them. So offensively, it's, it's very similar. There's certainly some aspects of Mike's offense that, that I want to keep. And Mike and I have talked about it. And he's excited about it, being able to implement a lot of the things that we did at Oklahoma in the running game and the passing game. Uh, I think some things that we were doing on, in both those run and pass are pretty pretty uh, on the cutting edge of stuff offensively, and I'm really pumped about the opportunity to blend those two systems together and, uh, and, and get the best offense for South Carolina going forward. Because at the end of the day, you've got to be tough. You've got to be physical. You've got to play with great discipline. Uh, you've got to have the ability to run and throw the football both. Uh, you've got to be a great situational football team, in my opinion, and, and we'll be all those things and being able to add like I said, combining the elements of it, I'm excited about. And what's up? What's up, Gamecocks? Uh, welcome back, GC Live. I'm Wes Mitchell. He is Chris Clark, and we are glad to be back. Hope everybody had a great Christmas, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year coming up. Brief hiatus from the show, but we are back. We sort of said if if some news broke during the break, we we may hop in and and sort of do something as far as the show goes, but uh, no official news until Sunday. We're back here on Monday afternoon, coming at you live, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and after the fact on the podcast. So again, hope you had a great holiday. And uh, Chris, an extended open there from Shane Beamer, um, who, by the way, gives – he he expounds a lot on his decisions, it, it seems like. And I, I saw what one – of our posters on GamecockCentral.com. If you're listening or watching and you're not a poster on GamecockCentral.com, come on board and, and hang out with us. But he, he basically, the poster said, um, I feel like Coach Beamer talks to us, as in Coach Beamer explains, may, maybe even has seen or heard some of the things that have been said out there on Twitter, on our message boards, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I thought gave a real explanation for why, you know, why he brought on the the three coaches he brought on, why he kept the four coaches that he's, you know, he's decided to keep in on the field roles. And I thought very appropriate, even though it was a long open, very appropriate to start with Mike Bobo. We're going to dive into all the seven official coaches. 
We're going to dive into what it means for South Carolina on the field and recruiting. And we're going to dive into maybe what's next as far as this goes during the show. But I thought it was appropriate that we had to start with Mike Bobo, man. This, to me, has been the most, um, uh, I would say, compelling situation as far as an argument on one side or the other from the fan base. Not everyone in agreement about the decision. But um, I I thought uh, Beamer sort of, rather than just saying, Bobo's a great coach and he's my guy, um, tried to explain a a good bit of his thought process there, man. So, uh, Chris, welcome back, dude. Hope you had a good holiday. Hope you all had a good Christmas, the family, the kids. Um, how's it going? And, uh, what were your thoughts, uh, a on just the press conferences today in general and B on specifically that part, uh, Mike Bobo. Yeah. Great, great holiday, man. Appreciate it. Uh, good to be back and appreciate, uh, shoot. A lot of people already back day one uh, of the show from the holiday break. So yeah, to start there with, with Bobo, I think you're, you, you're exactly right. That's been maybe the most, I don't know, the most polarizing thing. Um, after watching offensive struggles for the most part for a few years, um, people, you know, are very curious about that direction. And I think a lot of people in finding out that Shane Beamer liked the idea or, or maybe pitched, I guess you could say, if you want to use that word, the idea of bringing an Oklahoma type offense to Columbia, they look at Mike Bobo and go, well, that that's not it. And so th- there's a bunch of layers to it. Number one, no, it's not completely it. But there's so many different, like I said, layers and facets to this thing. So I'm trying to think of where to even start. So here's one thing, and this is what Beamer mentioned. You know, Oklahoma's offense, people say air raid. But how many times on the show or on our forums, Wes, have we talked about this? Lincoln Riley's version of the offense, the the quote-unquote air raid, is very different, or not very different. It has a lot of differences from what, say, Mike Leach still runs. Lincoln Riley got to Oklahoma, saw that they had really good backs, and they really went heavy on run game. They have quarterback run concepts, and then obviously they've always had good backs at Oklahoma. Even when Lincoln Riley was at East Carolina, because I interviewed him at the time when South Carolina played East Carolina a couple different times during that same era, he would talk a lot about We run the ball a little bit more. It's more of an emphasis for us. And so when you look at Mike Bobo's offense, certainly last year the run game was a huge emphasis. Now that was partially out of necessity. South Carolina had two guys on offense that could on a consistent basis hurt you, one in the run game, one in the pass game. They found a way to get the ball to both of those guys. Kevin Harris led the league in rushing during the regular season. So that part was successful. Some other parts were not. Um, so I, I think here's what I go to, Wes. Here's my question is it's more of a discussion point is when people say they want the Oklahoma offense, I think there's a few different things to it. A, do they totally understand what that is? B, what about the Oklahoma offense do they want? Is it the pass game concepts as a quarterback run or is it just the production, right? <laughs> Because if you want the production from the Oklahoma offense, that's great. But South Carolina is not there to be able to produce like Oklahoma. And that's the case if they ran the triple option, they ran the wishbone, if they ran the spread, if they ran I formation, if they ran exactly what Lincoln Riley runs at Oklahoma, um, you do have to consider personnel. It'd be a little bit silly. Like if people think Oklahoma is throw it 70 times a game, which it's not, that would be a very bad strategy objectively. <laughs> you know, for South Carolina right now. So I guess what part of it do you want? There are some things, if you go back and look at Bobo's offense at Colorado State, he used an H-back. He spread it out more. Were all the concepts in the pass game and run game the same? No, not all of them. Um, But he did mix it up more than at Colorado State. Yeah, man, and I think – like like you said, there's a, I think you maybe used the word layers. There there's a lot of layers to to all to this conversation, and you know I, I think first of all let, let's let's go back through the four coaches that were officially retained. This was all announced yesterday. It's official pending a it's officially official pending the BOT you know meeting approving you know approving it whatever that will happen. But for all intents and purposes, it is official enough that they had a press conference today. The three new coaches were introduced, and they're, um, you know, taking the recruiting test and then talking to recruits. So um, 
the four guys return, obviously Mike Bobo, Des Kitchings on the offensive side of the ball, Tracy Rocker, Mike Peterson on the defensive side of the ball. All four of those guys uh, remaining in their current uh, or past roles, you would say, at South Carolina. And then the addition of Eric Kimry, um, which we reported on, I don't remember which day last year or last week, Thursday maybe, I um, believe was when Kimry came on board uh, the South Carolina staff as tight ends coach. Then uh, Will Friend, former Tennessee O-line coach, coming over to South Carolina. And then Pete Limbo, who is special teams coach and associate head coach. So that's sort of the rundown there of those guys. But getting back into Mike Bobo, um, I, I thought Beamer sort of made a point to mention, hey, if this guy was not already on the staff at South Carolina, then he would um, have been one of my calls anyway, mentioned how he and Frank Beamer tried to hire Mike Bobo away from Georgia, you know, when they were at Virginia Tech uh, years ago. So that to me was was something that Beamer wanted to make sure to point out. It also felt like, Chris, to me, that he made it a point to, to say Bobo, Des Kitchings, and Tracy Rocker have not been at South Carolina for an extended period of time. Um, obviously, we know Mike P has been, but otherwise – I think his point in pointing that out, Chris, was that these guys have not really had time to make a huge imprint, a huge impact on this program yet. And, you know, it it would be one thing if you said, okay, these guys were all at South Carolina for five seasons and you kept on four guys, you know, does there need to be more of a change there? I think in the case of some of these guys – particularly I would say Bobo, Kitchings, and Tracy Rocker. Um, those are three guys he was already very familiar with yeah. and probably would have been phone calls regardless. Um, Mike Peterson was more that he sat down. He talked about this. The more people he talked to, the more it seemed apparent to him that he should keep Mike Peterson. So – you know, but but Bobo, Kitchings, and Rocker are all one year stays at South Carolina so far. Um, to me, Kitchings was a no brainer. Um, did a great job both with the running back room for the last five years. He's at a thousand yard rusher. Um, really has done a good job, I think, from what we understand of helping hold things together as far as recruiting in the meantime when the staff has been in flux. So all those things make sense. But again, to come back around to Bobo. I think it is very important to point out that South Carolina came in with a hope for what Bobo wanted his offense to be sort of in the long term, but in the short term, I think the, the, the plan sort of goes out the window, right? As far as going into this past season, we've talked about it all off season, all season long, and now all postseason. South Carolina did not have the personnel to put three and four wide receivers out there and say, we're just going to go throw the football around the yard. Um, They didn't even really have the personnel to just spread to run basically because teams aren't sitting out there designing defensive game plans to have to stop South Carolina's receiving core, you know, other than 13. So to me, I think some fans it's, it's multifaceted. Some fans are just mad that Ryan Holinsky did not play. In my opinion, that is 100% the case. But I think people also look at this scheme and say, well, this scheme is from the 1960s. Well, this is not the scheme play calling we saw Mike Bobo use at Colorado State. This is what they felt they had to do for this past season to get Kevin Harris some room to run and lean on really what ended up being once Shai Smith was out, being their only true proven playmaker, in my opinion. Long term, they will want to go, I believe, to more of a spread, sort of a spread to run type deal with elements of Bobo's offense and, as Beamer said, with elements of the Oklahoma offense. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I've had several people in the coaching industry say, if you want Bob, you know, Mike Bobo can run – any type of system that you want. Like he's sharp enough to do it. And chances are he's got experience doing it. Now, 
don't don't say, well, would Boba run like the option? I, I'm not saying that, but he's he's evolved his scheme over time. He's got a very multiple scheme, and so what we I think you you nailed it there in that South Carolina lining up and just running the football and that being the only redeeming quality of this team, which they did it very well this year. You know, you look at some of the game, some of the games, some of the performances. Um, you know that that's that's not all they want it to be, but that's sort of what it had to be this year. And they were able to, but this team, as as limited as it was from a personnel standpoint, and then you go to the end of, end of the year personnel and injuries. Um, you know, they still turned in some better performances against teams that they played than full strength teams who were supposed to be a lot better offensively. And so that says something. Um, I understand the people, people's frustration with the quarterback position, the people's frustration with the, the run game, but there's so much that goes into going back to layers. There's so much nuance, so many layers that go into looking at the offensive performance. Again, if you go back and you look at Bobo's body of work, as in game tape, you can even go back to Georgia when he was there. I guess his last year was 2014. Some of the latter years that he had at Georgia, what they ran at Colorado State, obviously that tenure as a whole didn't go well, but they were good offensively. They did some very good things offensively. You know, it was much more of a style of attack that you would expect South Carolina to eventually evolve into. Um but they don't need to evolve into that, and they can't evolve into that until they fix some of the personnel, you know, holes that they've got, namely at the receiver position. Yeah, and we know that's going to be a big emphasis. There, here's the thing: there, there are obviously holes on the roster, and that's not a shot at any kid. That's not, um, you know, a shot at anybody specifically. But there are holes on the roster, or, or there wouldn't be a coaching change. You make coaching changes because there are issues. So. We know there's a hole at receiver. We know there's a hole at defensive back. The The plan will be to try to recruit and develop your way out of that. Ultimately, um, you know, the, the Oklahoma offense, as you said, is balanced. And I think, and Beamer talked about this, the, the air raid, yes, it is a the, – the, the Mike Leach version of the air raid is we don't really think you have to run the football because short passing is – in our opinion, you know, speaking from Mike Leach's perspective, our opinion, throwing the the underneath game is just an extension of the running game. Yeah. Well, the air raid can be that, or the air raid can be those passing concepts, but you still implement other ways to run the football and, and have a more balanced attack. This is what we've seen um, – I would say the last five years or so, a lot of air raid people um, shoot, man, from from Neil Brown, who, uh, you know, I looked into when he was brought up as far as being a South Carolina guy. Um, someone I've always watched uh, stick with West Virginia, Dana Holgerson. He's from the uh, air raid uh, coaching tree. He sort of went from, hey, we're going to implement uh, some some spread option type stuff within the air raid passing game. So you have these branches of air raid that – it can still be the air raid from a schematic standpoint, but isn't necessarily a schematic standpoint of the passing game, but isn't necessarily um, that same philosophy as far as how many times you throw versus run the football. And as you said, Lincoln Riley was already trying to do those things when he, when he was at East Carolina. And we've seen, I think the thing is Oklahoma is sort of, that's sort of goals, right? Like that, that's the goal to be as balanced um, their their yards per play is what stands out to me. Um, they uh, you know st- stats as far as total yardage, passing yards, rushing yards sometimes get skewed, but their yards per play consistently towards the top. Now let's be honest, it's a great scheme, it's great play calling, and it's really good talent too. Yeah. So if I mean if. If you literally, in some weird alternate universe, if Shane Beamer convinced Lincoln Riley to come run his offense at South Carolina next year, it's not going to just magically poof, you know, be amazing. 40 points a game. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just not going to happen. Lincoln Riley all would come in and, and, and say, and he would do a similar thing that he did at Oklahoma, but on an even greater scale, he would say, all right, let's look around and see what we got. We need to run the ball a lot. You know? like Yes. That's what he would say. And 
look like look at, at Oklahoma this year. They ran the ball when you're talking about attempts. They ran the ball more than they passed it. They averaged 71 plays a game. They averaged 38 carries rushing per game. I don't think this is adjusted for sacks or anything. So, but still I'll take it for what it is. And then almost 34 passing attempts a game. So very balanced, but not we're chucking it all around the yard type of thing, right? They mm-hmm. run the ball a lot. I mean, we've been telling people this. They run the ball a lot in Lincoln Riley's offense. And so conceptually, and then you, you have, I don't think you like Beamer is a guy that regardless of what you think, he's been coaching power five level for what, 21 years. So he knows generally what he's seeing. I don't, he's not going on a press conference just saying there are a lot of similarities schematically between what Oklahoma's doing maybe. And I don't know if he was referring to pass game, run game, which particular thing he was talking about, but there are some similarities. He's not just pulling that out of thin air as a line to tell people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. And I agree. And I I think um, you look, man, that this is going to be, it's going to evolve just like, um, and, and Travis, I, I see Travis's comment here. I see you and I hear you. Yes. I mean, Oklahoma, has run some version of the air raid for for a long time. I I think, and, and I don't watch Oklahoma every week. I'm not saying I do or they have had some deep dive into their offense, but um, I think some of the run game elements are what maybe Lincoln Riley has has implemented there uh, compared to to what Oklahoma's version of the air raid was. I mean, you can go all the way back. Um, Mike Leach was an offensive coordinator at, at Oklahoma, so they've always sort of been. Uh, infatuated with this air raid passing attack, I think. It's just about how do you package it up? How do you package up the, that scheme of plays from a passing standpoint with your your offensive running game? And, you know, that, that was one thing, you know, we were told about Mike Bobo. For every single run he had this season in the playbook, there is a passing game play-action concept off of that. So Bobo's offenses have always been packaged up as opposed to just being a number of random plays to where they complement each other. So I I think if you're Bobo, you're probably pretty excited. You don't have to move your family again. I know his his kids are um, you know, are in the area. Some of his kids are at Ben Lippin, some are at uh, at Hammond and just um you move your family here for for one year, get them settled in. You get to stick it out, but now you sort of get to maybe implement some new some new things. He and Beamer seem to be on the page about that, on the same page about that. Somebody asked earlier, Chris, I can't remember who it was, but asked, will Bobo meet with the Oklahoma staff or meet with Lincoln Riley? Um, I haven't been told that. I don't know if you – you know, I don't think we've been told that, but that wouldn't surprise me because we know coaches share ideas all the time. We know Beamer is a big networker. Um, We know that the transition with Beamer, you know, leaving out there is a very amicable deal. He stayed and and kept – you know, kept up his end of the job, finished the season with Oklahoma, won a championship. I wouldn't be at all surprised whether it's in person post COVID or whether it's just over Zoom or something. And you know, these days, if Bobo and Beamer and and uh, Lincoln Riley and that staff, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was some type of exchange of information there. Wouldn't you think? Yeah, and we haven't heard that that'll happen. And obviously, you know, Beamer, Shane Beamer himself. I mean, he cited one of the reasons as one of the reasons that he went out to Oklahoma was to see, you know, Lincoln Riley's way of doing things and, um, you know, to learn that offense as well. And so obviously with him being a position coach offensively, you know, is he someone that's prepared to go start calling an offense or, or wants to do that? No, he doesn't want to do that. Um, but certainly concept wise, um, he very much knows what they do now. And he said today, even that he wants to be involved you know, on that side of the ball. And so I think you'll see some concept carry over, you know, at a minimum from, you know, just bringing some new ideas to the table. Yeah. So let's see. I, golly, we've already talked 25 minutes and we haven't even gotten into any other uh, coaches. So I, I've got, I've actually got Beamer's comments on all the guys, but I think we're going to run out of time before we get into all of them. Um, let's, Let's go into the new coaches then, because I, I think everybody at least has a feel. We talked about we've talked about why you know you keep a Des Kitchings. Um, we've talked about Rocker and Mike P a little bit today. Let's go into Pete Limbo. 
uh, a guy that I think most people, Chris, probably myself included, weren't that familiar with until now. But I think uh, makes complete sense as a hire for Shane Beamer. And I'm going to play his comments right now real quick. This is Shane Beamer on why he hired Pete Limbo, not only to be a special teams coordinator, but a very important distinction, I think. Um, he's also the associate head coach. So here's Beamer on Pete Limbo. Uh, uh, Pete Limbo, our new associate head coach, and special teams coordinator. When you talk about – if you asked any college coach in the country – uh, who are the top special teams coaches in the entire world? Uh, there's no doubt that, that Pete Limbo's name would come up in the first one or two, three guys that were mentioned by every college coach. He has that much respect from people across the country. We actually at Oklahoma, we had a special teams meeting earlier this season, and I've told Pete this story. Uh, it was early on. I think they played Arkansas State in their first game before uh, the regular season really got going for everybody else. And, and we we made a point, uh, the coach for us at South Carolina or at Oklahoma that coached our kickoff team, put – a shot of Memphis's kickoff team covering a kick against Arkansas State. Just to say in our first game this week, this is the emotion, this is the effort, this is the passion that we need to play with when we cover kicks because it was amazing, uh, amazing to watch. He's always, uh, he's, he's always, this is not to knock anywhere that he's been, but a lot of places that he has been, he's been at places where maybe they don't have quite the talent of the, uh, their opponents, the people in their conference. And he's produced top end special teams year in, year out on a consistent basis. Uh, I'm a special teams guy. I'm excited about that. I want to continue to be involved in special teams and, and not get away from that, just like I'll be involved with the offense and the defense. Uh, but a chance to get a guy like Pete Limbo in here, I wasn't going to hire just a special teams coordinator. If Pete Limbo had decided not to come and he had other options, more than one out there as well, if Coach Limbo had decided not to come, I'm not even sure I would have hired a special teams coordinator. I had a bunch of them hitting me up, and it's certainly something that I would have considered. But if I couldn't get the, what I consider the very best in the country, uh, I'm not sure I would have hired one. I would have probably used that position to go in a different direction and, and coached on myself with amongst the staff. But an opportunity to get him, who is uh, elite, in my opinion, was a no-brainer. I love the fact that he's been a head coach before, uh, along with Mike Bobo. As a first-time head coach, I want to be able to rely on these guys and some of the things that they've been through, good and bad, that I can rely on as a resource. He's got great recruiting ties and, and personal ties in this part of the country, the state of North Carolina, and uh, and up and down the East Coast. Um, so we'll bring a lot to the table and certainly thankful that he and his family are, are headed to Columbia. So, Chris, uh, I, I don't know – again, I don't know about you. I wasn't as familiar with, with Pete Limbo. I obviously – the second the name comes up, you start Googling, start looking around, seeing what's out there. Uh, this hire to me made, as soon as you started reading the bio and the other things out there, made absolutely 100% complete sense. And I say that because it does appear as a first-time head coach that Beamer wants some, some guys with experience in that position that he can lean on. But two, we know how important special teams has always been to the Beamer family. We know about Beamer Ball with Frank Beamer at Virginia Tech. This is someone who gives South Carolina that opportunity uh, to potentially find those hidden gains that Limbo talked about within special teams that you're going to have to find if you're South Carolina and also allows Beamer to hand that position over to someone he trusts. Um, he, I mean, he said it himself right there. If he couldn't find a, basically a special teams guru, he was going to do it himself. But – this is one more thing, I think, off of Beamer's plate, which uh, we know as a first-year head coach especially is going to be a very full plate. Yeah, it is. And um, that shows you how highly he thinks of Limbo to be able to, as he said, you know, what wasn't going to just hire a special teams guy just to have one. I mean, sometimes at schools you see um, a whole staff approach or maybe the head coach coaches it a lot. You know, you saw that like with Urban Meyer, like he was very involved in special teams. Beamer, that seemed to be sort of at least I don't know if I'd say his initial plan, but one of his plans was I can handle special teams and split it amongst the staff as well. Um, sometimes at schools you see a guy coach special teams and a position. So say special teams and tight end, special teams and running back. Sometimes you just have a straight up special teams coordinator, and that's what Limbo is really focused on. Um, head coaching wise at Ball State, he won games there, which is not an easy thing to do. 
Um, and he's really, really highly regarded. And as you said, Wes, when you look into statistically what he's done in turning Memphis around, I mean, his impact was immediate. It was substantial. And so for South Carolina, they're, they're not going to be at, at an advantage like some of their opponents yet in terms of their personnel. There's positions, key positions, where they're not as good right now, wide receiver, defensive back. Um, a lot of those positions are going to play special teams for you. And so they got to get better. But Pete Limbo can potentially, from a scheme standpoint, give you an advantage there. And that's why when Beamer looked around and, and knew he had a chance to get him, you know, it made sense because it can be a differentiator and, and a big factor for South Carolina. You, you look at Limbo, man, like you said, um, uh, his special teams at Memphis, and, and I, I know there's sort of some next level type of analytics and statistics that go past your traditional statistics. And the ESPN, this was on his bio, um, Memphis's special teams in the ESPN team efficiency rankings uh, for special teams went from 59th in 2018, which is the year before he got there, to second in, uh, in 2019. Um, they also earned college football's highest ratings for, quote, special teams points added from Championships Analytics Inc.'s and uh, Inc., I should say, were ranked in the top 10 for overall special teams by footballoutsiders.com. He also was, Chris, one of the few guys I ever remember seeing that are a, that was a finalist for the Broyles Award, which is for the top assistant from a special teams coach. You know, generally that's going to be an OC or a DC. Um, now, some of that is, is, like you said, special teams get split many different ways sometimes, but to, to sort of be a a top finalist or a finalist for that award as a special teams guy, I think says a lot. And I do think that um, the, the fact that you ha can have 10 on-field assistants now is one of the reasons that gives you a little bit more flexibility, uh, you know, to, to make a move like this and say, this guy's going to be my special teams coordinator. He's going to be an associate head coach, but he doesn't necessarily have to take another position up. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely does. Gives you more flexibility. And so now you sort of look at the composition of the staff and, you know, with with Tracy Rocker and Mike Peterson both still being on, you can, you're you still splitting the defensive line right now unless, and we have not heard this to be clear, but Mike Peterson obviously played linebacker. So in theory, could he coach it? I would think so. So, you know, this this gives you the flexibility. You've got a special teams coach now, so then you start looking at your other slots. You've got three coaching slots. You would think they would be, you know, the two positions that need coaching as of right now are linebacker or in the secondary. You need a DC. You need a receivers coach. So you could do some combo of new, you know, the new DC is either going to coach DBs, linebackers, or in theory you could have another defensive line coach hired and, and move Peterson to linebackers. Now that's not anything we've heard. In fact, from what we've heard, Wes, it seems like things are status quo right now with Rocker and, and Peterson splitting the line. But just to illustrate how with these 10 spots, to your point, you know, there's some flexibility there. Yeah, that, that certainly helps when you're trying to – it's it's like a puzzle. You're trying to put all the pieces together of this staff. Um, all right, before we get rolling any further, we got to talk about Affordable Medical USA and AffordableMedicalUSA.com, which I should have mentioned in the open of the show. They are our primary sponsor – here and they make our daily shows possible. Um, they are, of course, home of the game day chair. So check out AffordableMedicalUSA.com, 803-926-1493. Hopefully somebody out there got the game day chair for Christmas. Chris, if they did get one, what would they uh, be experiencing watching the show right now? Well, I mean, a, a variety of things they could be experiencing. You could be in zero gravity in the twilight position, which is the lay flat position in the game day chair. Or you could be lounging or in the TV watching position, all at the push of a button, extreme comfort with the game day chair, great addition to your man cave, your living room, or any room in your house. Make sure you check it out. Click the link in the description of our YouTube video if you're on the podcast, listening after the live show on download. It's on our podcast page too. And hey, make sure while you're doing that, you're sporting your dead socksy socks. Wes, did you get any socks for Christmas? I did. Okay. I got a lot of socks for Christmas. Lots of socks for Christmas. Dead Soxy, of course, another sponsor here that we love at Gamecock Central. The new, uh, we're calling it the Spur Line, unofficial name for the Dead Soxy Socks. We have the link 
on GamecockCentral.com. Go there. If you go to DeadSoxy, D-E-A-D-S-O-X-Y.com, and you can uh, visit their college section, and you will see the Spur line of socks. They got striped version. They got one with the Spurs. Didn't forget the Spurs. Unlike the Gamecock bronze statue, everybody was talking about that. Adding the Spurs later, these socks already have them. So make sure you go check those guys out at DeadSoxy.com. Yes. Um, funny how people stopped talking about that whole Spurs thing after the season got rolling, and I guess there were more important things to, to be mad about. Um, okay, so, yeah, so that's Limbo. He's a guy with ties to the Carolinas, a guy that obviously um, very – I won't say well known because special teams coordinators aren't well known. I, I feel like outside of the the circle of, of football, but uh, very well known within football coaching circles as as being one of the top special teams guys in the country. So I would say that the next guy that has sort of been up there with Bobo Chris as far as being met with a little bit of skepticism from a portion of the fan base would be offensive line coach Will Friend, um, someone that. Obviously, you look at um, his time at Tennessee. There, there are problems at Tennessee right now. There are actually, I would say, lots of coaches who have wanted out at Tennessee. Um, Friend was able to accomplish that, get out of there. Um, has recruited, I would say, very well on the offensive line at Tennessee. Um, you know, as far as landing some guys that, that a lot of other people wanted and getting some highly recruited kids. Um, offensive line play this past season not necessarily the strength that Tennessee thought it was going to be. So, yes, South Carolina fans have questioned this. Uh, I do think the other side of that is when Friend and Bobo have been together, uh, they've been very, very successful. Friend was the offense coordinator and O-line coach at Colorado State um, for a number of years and uh, obviously was the offensive line coach at Georgia when Mike Bobo was there for a number of years as well. Beamer went as far as to talk to some former players at Georgia who played under Friend at the time, he said, and I think this was a matter of bringing in someone that was entirely comfortable with Bobo and what he's looking for from an offensive line coach and is entirely comfortable with his scheme, his terminology, and, and everything else that goes with that. Yeah, and I think that point, the last point you made is is the key one. There, there's a lot of – you know, they're on the same page. And we see this sometimes with offensive coordinators who have sort of their preferred offensive line coach to work with. Now, everything I've heard is, you know, Mike Bobo and Eric Wolford, I think they work well together. Mike Bobo's obviously worked with some other O-line coaches, Stacey Sarles, who's now at North Carolina, being one of them. But Friend is someone that he has ample experience with. Those guys are close. I think they think along the same lines pretty similarly. And so, obviously, Friend – is very, very familiar with the scheme that Bobo's going to run. He's coached in it. And so they're going to be sort of one in the same in terms of their line of thinking. So um, I think when you think of friend, you think of a guy that, you know, is going to be more of a, of a developer type, you know. Um, obviously, it's going to be critical for South Carolina to continue to recruit well on the offensive line in some form or fashion. Um, but they do have some young guys on the offensive line that can continue coming along. And so – uh, that has to be the hope, and and I think it's something that the, this duo has sort of proven. They have developed some offensive linemen, and um, I remember Eric Wolford even saying at one point that Mike Bobo's scheme is offensive line friendly. I think we saw some of that this year in the run game with some of the things that they were able to create. So, um, yeah, not not a surprising hire with Will Friend once we knew that Bobo was going to be the guy. That was immediately one of the names that came up as a possibility to to head to Columbia. All right, let's go into Eric Kimry, former Hammond coach. Um, as I said, uh, you broke the news on Thursday, I think, that uh, Kimry would be coming on board, new tight ends coach. And I do want to play Beamer talking about Kimry, and we'll do that right now. And then uh, finally, our new tight ends coach, Eric Kimry. I guess it's not really a welcome or a welcome back. It's it's a welcome over uh, since he's just heading across town. But uh, you, a guy that loves Carolina, and that's important to me. All seven of these guys are guys that want to be at Carolina for the right reasons. Uh, it's well-versed and, and well-known how much Eric Kimry, what South Carolina means to him and his family over multiple uh, generations. He's a guy, if you look at high school coaches that have made the jump to college to college coaching, and this isn't a knock on, on any other coach in that role, but I would argue that he's more qualified than any high school coach that's ever made the jump to college football. 
He played college football. He coached college football with Coach Holtz. He's won 12 state championships, if I'm not mistaken. And he's done it at a high, high level over a long time consistently. Um, he saw with Boogie Huntley and Jordan Birch and the countless number of other players that have come out of Hammond, he saw every college coach in practically the country roll through his high school. And he had a front row seat to college coach after college coach after college coach uh, that he visited with, that he saw talk to his players, that he was able to observe and learn from some of the good things they did, some of the bad things uh, that they did. So that's been a great, you know, that'll be a great resource for us as well. And something that certainly helped him prepare him for this opportunity. And, and he's not just coming to Carolina because he's a third generation Gamecock and has won a bunch of championships. He's a, he's a heck of a football coach that uh, has a great offensive mind that when I was coaching with coach Spurrier, Back in 2007, 8, 9, and 10, we used to talk about Eric Kimbrey and how uh, brilliant an offensive mind he had, the way that he thought as a head coach. And, and he's certainly a guy that uh, loves Carolina, um, but will certainly help Carolina as well on and off the field. He's jumped into recruiting. I know he talked to some tight ends last night that were recruiting already, and they texted me as soon as they got off the phone with him how uh, how much they loved their visit with him and how they could tell the passion coming out of his voice. And and I was excited about that. And he's a guy that in my trips to Hammond, and, and I've always uh, gone through Hammond uh, trying to recruit Jordan Birch and trying to recruit Boogie, whether I was at uh, the University of Georgia or Lincoln Riley and I spent a day uh, at Hammond back when, when I was coaching at Oklahoma and we were trying to recruit those two guys. And, and he's someone that I always enjoyed visiting with and talking to uh, in my trips there and really thankful that I've been able to uh, get him on this staff. So, uh, I mean, complete transparency. Uh, Kimry has been on our show. Uh, we've been on his show. He's a very media friendly guy. Um, obviously had the show on 107.5. Most of the media guys um, already, you know, know, Eric Kimry, based on uh, the fact that probably the most uh, in the media high school head coach in the state, um, probably maybe in state history, as far as head football coaches go, with a, like I said, his time on 107.5, his podcast, him coming on our show. He had a column for Gamecock Central for a few weeks. Uh, so we, may, I may be a little biased, but I thought today just him talking, Chris, uh, in the press conference, you, you were almost already, and he was asked about it specifically, you're already sort of hearing his what will be his recruiting pitch, which I even hesitate to call it a recruiting pitch because I think it's just sort of his reality, and that's that Eric Kimry clearly loves the University of South Carolina, loves the football program, um, I believe has probably had in his head uh, what maybe needs to happen to sort of fix the, the program moving forward. Um, he wasn't going to leave Hammond for any other job. This was sort of a dream job, not sort of this is a dream job for him. Um, he's already jumped into it. Uh, you had an article on GamecockCentral.com where he's already talked to one of the top uh, tight ends in the country, someone that also has some South Carolina connections. And Chris even has a connection to the Kimry family, funny enough, and, and may actually get his first recruiting win as a coach in the form of, uh, of Nick Muse, who – uh, Kimry said he was confident, you know, would be back at South Carolina, still working through that decision officially, it sounds like. But Kimry, I mean, that, that was his words. I'm confident, you know, that, that he'll be back. So I think anyone who maybe hasn't heard Eric Kimry talk or was just a little bit um, just unsure about bringing, you know, somebody making that jump from high school to college, go listen. It's on our YouTube right now. It's on GamecockCentral.com as well, YouTube.com slash Gamecock Central. Go listen to his press conference. To, from today, and you will hear the passion. You will hear the uh, just the fight that Eric Kimry seems to have for wanting to make South Carolina football better. Yeah, and that's a good point. So obviously, this is going to go back to recruiting. You know, whoever is here at South Carolina, you've got to recruit well. You're going to have to have really talented players. You're going to have to have a good culture. That's how you win. And so it's a, it's when you think about it, it's sort of a simple formula almost, but it's really hard to do, you know, particularly if you're not a blue blood school. And so when you look at Kimry, we, we know Wes from just knowing him and how he operates and the type of guy and the type of coach he is, he's, he's unique in terms of coaches, you know, he's, he's a unique type of guy and he also has a unique situation. So you're exactly right in that. It's not a recruiting pitch when Eric Kimry talks about South Carolina 
in the experience of South Carolina to recruits, he's lived it. You know, it's not something that's just sort of out there in the ether. It's not a, it's not a pitch. It's not salesy. It's something that he can say, I grew up here. I've kept my family here. I played at South Carolina. I had this one great moment, you know, really in, 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 in Gamecock lore and all that has carried over and helped lead to where he is now, which is, you know, extremely successful high school coach at Hammond, 12 state titles, set a bunch of records, you know, for coaching, and then has been able to transition back to the university for his dream job. And so these are the types of things that he can sell, not just, and these other parts are important too, but it's not just come to South Carolina, get a good education, come play in the SEC, come get developed for the NFL. You add some unique, you know, perspective to it. And those are the types of things that for certain types of recruits um, can make a little bit of a difference. And and that's frankly where they're at is they're going to have to land a guy or two at the beginning in recruiting whatever position is, whether Kimry recruits them or other people recruit them. They're going to have to get to the spot where they get a couple guys who buy into, hey, you know, this is a little bit different. I want to I want to be a part of this. Yeah, and I think um... – it was interesting, you know. Obviously, uh, he he thanked he thanked a lot of people, and you know his his letter to Hammond, um, I thought was uh, was an example of how uh, you know Kimry thinks a little bit differently uh, than your average coach, I think. But um, you know, thanked his parents, thanked him, and thanked uh, his former players. But also, um, I believe Chris thanked the other high school coaches in the state, and I, I thought um, was interesting how he mentioned. You know, I've I've been there. I, I know what it's like to be a high school coach. I know what it's like to, um, you know, to be an er- early in your career high school coach where you're you're having to make sure that the headsets are charged and, um, you know, that uh, the equipment is in the right spot and stuff like that. There's a certain connection there, uh, as far as what it's like, um, to be a high school football coach, as opposed to let's be honest, man, a college football coach in the SEC, all the other little stuff for a game day is handled by someone you know that's that's got a job that's sort of below your job honestly as as far as the lack of a way to say it if you're a high school head coach especially a young one starting out in a program you got to handle all this different stuff and I think just sort of understanding that and then understanding the recruiting process uh from the other side of that coaches you know I would say office, you know, we were sitting there. He sat over there and listened to Lincoln Riley come in and, and talk ball from their perspective or listen to Ed O come in and recruit Jordan Birch, stuff like that. Um, it, it's different, I, I think. and It's a unique perspective. And um, obviously, I don't know if there was anyone – I would imagine there wasn't a single person in Columbia that was happier on Sunday afternoon than Eric Kimry. <laughs> when it became official that he was going to be an on the field football coach at South Carolina. And all if if you just took a random guy that loved South Carolina and said go be a coach, that wouldn't matter. But you throw in someone that that is uh, just as intelligent as Kimry and has been through and the experiences he has with the fact that he does love this place and has a passion for this place and, and stuff like that. To me, that that matters and, and will mean a lot going forward. And as I said, he, he's already got maybe a couple of recruiting, a recruiting win potentially under his belt. And uh, I know you had an article. Um, you want to tell everybody, Chris, real quick, without giving it all away, about the kid that, that Kimry did talk to on Sunday? Yeah, so Oscar Delp, who a four-star guy out of Georgia, uh, West Forsyth High, one of the uh, one of the top tight ends in the country. I think Rivals has him as the fifth best tight end in the country, um, or somewhere around there. Um, really talented kid. Lots of connections. Grew up a Gamecock fan. Grew up going to games. His mom attended South Carolina, and the connection you mentioned earlier to Kimry himself is uh, Oscar's uncle um, actually played for Bill Kimry, who's Eric's father in high school, and so uh, there's a connection there. That uncle, by the way, ended up going to Clemson. Um, so Oscar Delph has a Clemson offer. He's got a bunch of other offers, but, uh, they already connected Kimry's first day on the job. He spoke with Oscar Delp and, um, you know, good conversation. So full story up on Gamecock central for subscribers. If you guys want to check that out. 
I uh, appreciate Doc Graybeard throwing the five spot at us, Chris. Um, he wants to know from one of us, what's the biggest surprise or under the radar recruit that South Carolina could snag moving forward? That is a good question. Do you have an answer, Chris? <laughs> well, if it's a surprise, I, I don't know that we could peg a surprise right now, right? Um, like unless you, unless you looked at it and said like a guy like Trevin Wallace out of Georgia, like if he up and committed to South Carolina, you know, in a few days or something, that would be a surprise. But no indications that's going to happen. It'll it'll take until, you know, February to sort that out. Um, I think if if there's any su- surprises or maybe like an under-the-radar guy that we haven't discussed, there could be some pop-up that we don't know about, but like the transfer portal is one to watch, right? And so there are probably going to be some other guys enter the portal that South Carolina is going to be in on. I don't know if there's one guy that I could point to, like as a, I mean, under the radar. I mean, Jawan Gaston, would he maybe count as that? The, the DB out of Alabama, you know, who's waiting until February to sign. He might be one um, that, that would count that. But there's, you know, there, there are going to be some new names pop up, and the transfer portal is obviously going to be huge this offseason as well. So I would probably point to, to that concept more than anything. Yeah, the, the portal is going to be important, as we've said over and over. Um, a guy I wrote about a little bit yesterday is uh, Amarion Brown from Georgia Tech, someone that would come in, I think, and compete for a, a starting spot as a slot receiver right off the bat. Uh, someone in South Carolina is sort of targeted uh, to come in at that spot, and I, I think they'll try to take several receivers, uh, be it from you know high school ranks, JUCO ranks, or the um, – you know, the portal, and, and that'll be important. That's, again, a spot they've got to fix moving forward. Uh, let, let's dive into to Nick Muse a little bit, Chris, because there's – I don't know, man. I, there's a, I, I don't really like the way some people have reacted to Nick Muse. Um, for one, we've, we've learned Nick Muse will say how he feels in press conferences – which the the, our, the the thing there is that we don't like when players are like robots in press conferences and just give you canned answers. But then when someone tells you how they feel, we get our feelings hurt. So, um, for one, I love the way Nick Muse says whatever he thinks in press conferences because it keeps things interesting. But first of all, he did he said if Coach Bentley is back. I will be back. But he, th- I've seen the reaction of that saying he had an ultimatum. He never said the opposite of that, as in, if Bentley is not back, I won't be back. So let's, let's first of all not put words in his mouth. Second of all, why are we acting like this team couldn't use a Nick Muse? Because, dude, did we see the offense this year? Like, no, nobody is saying that Nick is necessarily right now a first-round draft pick, but the guy can help South Carolina. He was the second leading receiver from his tight end position. He's actually – I looked it up on Pro Football Focus. He's the fifth highest graded tight end in the league and actually is fourth when you eliminate uh, guys who barely played. So you're telling me South Carolina, the same one that we've been talking about not having any receiving threats – for the last 12 months, and we're going to have to talk about it for the next 12 months, unfortunately. I hope we don't because it's getting – it's a tiring conversation. There's a portion of people telling me that South Carolina shouldn't be excited if Nick Muse comes back. That's ridiculous in my opinion. So um, if he does come back, if he makes that official, if Kimry is right in, in being confident that he's back, that is at least one spot that you don't have to worry about quite as much going into next year. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, tight end would be a question. Are there some young guys on the roster that have a chance to be good? There are, but they're unproven. Muse is a guy that has proven that he can make plays, you know, at the SEC level. And he's had some big games some big moments in his career too. And so that, that would be a significant get. You know, everybody wants to – recruit this roster to a point, uh, coaches, fans, whoever alike, to where there's there's just studs all over the field at every position. You're not there right now. 
And so anybody who has played for this team, who has made plays, who has a chance to help next year, regardless of position, they need. And so Muse clears that bar by far. You know, I mean, it's not just uh, he maybe could help and he has, he's played some, he has experience. No, this is – he's played and he's played very well at times for South Carolina. So um, – He's a guy that they definitely – I mean, that would be a significant boost to get him back because they're going to need every bit of help they can offensively, especially in the passing game. And, and Kimry talked about uh, his leadership ability too, being someone who can add leadership to a team that, uh, you know, is going to need it next year, frankly. So the, why – you should be happy that you have another option back because, hey, guess what? Shy, 13 is gone. Shy Smith is gone. So um, you, you don't need to get – there's not you don't want to add another question mark at a position because you have enough of those already, and it allows some of those younger guys at tight end that are still coming along to sort of come along. I would say um, at at their own pace as opposed to just being thrown out there and, and sort of thrown into the fire. Um, all right, man. So that that's about all of the seven. So moving forward. Uh, you have obviously three spots left for the 10 on the field positions. Um, and Connor Shaw, by the way, staying on in a yet to be determined, a yet to be molded off the field role. Sounds like it will be similar to his prior off the field role, but also will include a little bit more football stuff um, as opposed to just off the field stuff. But moving forward, three spots left. We know at this point one of those spots will go to a wide receiver coach. We know at this point they'll go to a defense coordinator. And then depending on what the defense coordinator coaches on the defensive side of the ball, it looks like it would be either be a linebacker's coach or a DB's coach. So um, it's sort of been, frankly, hard to sort through what's real and what's rumor out there as far as these final three spots. Obviously. Again, you're putting together the pieces of a puzzle, so it's all got to fit together. Um, clearly, the name Torian Gray at Florida continues to come up a lot as being someone on staff. Um, you know, they have a bowl game coming up. You look at a lot of the other names that are out there. All these guys are still playing in bowl games or even playing in you know NFL seasons and stuff like that. So I think – it sounds like Beamer and those guys thought it was important to go ahead and get these seven guys announced so they can start getting to work. Uh, but now I guess we'll sort of have to wait and see how these final three spots play out. Yeah, and Gray, Gray is one that looks like a very likely addition. Just, you know, there's some other pieces to, to move there. Um, but I, I expect another little mini flurry of activity, you know, after bowl games, depending on maybe after the NFL season, there's a, there's a wide receiver coach candidate or potential candidate that, um, you know, coaches in the NFL. And so, um, you know, obviously defensive coordinator is going to be the key sort of you know, hinge for these other moves, whether you definitely hire that DB coach, which I, I do think would be Torrey and Gray, whether you shift somebody at linebackers, how, how you split responsibilities on the defense, the defensive coordinator and his background, you know, is going to be critical for that. So we do have some notes on Gamecock Central on that front. Still, for our subscribers that we posted, lost track of the days, Wes. I think that was yesterday. And mm -hmm. hopefully a little bit more coming uh, tonight, tomorrow. We're going to continue tracking all these coaching situations and keep everyone apprised. Yeah, no doubt. Hopefully you'll come check that out on Gamecock Central. Um, our boy Lou Antonelli, Chris, a, a big supporter of the show and the site, wants to know our thoughts on Muschamp to Michigan as defensive coordinator. Uh would that surprise you? It would. I'd be pretty surprised if that happened. Um, you know, Muschamp, uh, I'm not totally ruling it out. I would be extremely surprised, though. Um, I have not heard that. I know that there were some other jobs I heard that were not in the Southeast uh, that Muschamp was not interested in. And so he, he's always been a Southeast guy. Um, he can take his time, obviously, in finding the right role. And when you look at you know, I think fit's going to be important there. And then you look at, um, you know, the, just the lifestyle change going out to Michigan. I, I just, I don't see that at all. I, I think, I think the whole genesis of that was, wasn't, I could be wrong, but I think it was just like somebody put something up on Twitter saying it or something. 
And so um, I really don't think there's anything to that. I could see Muschamp, you know, taking a smaller role somewhere uh, down south for a while and eventually getting back into the defensive coordinator game. We'll, we'll see what happens there. But I, I doubt there's anything to him going to Michigan. Well, it is pretty cold up there, <laughs> for one thing. So yes. if, you don't, if you don't have to go, you know, no, nobody's forcing you to make that move if you're Muschamp. Yeah. You're going to have options in the southeast. So yeah. um, I don't know if he's ever coached you know, anywhere close to that far north. So, um, nope. but, it, but it's funny how, how much traction something thrown on Twitter can get uh, oh, yeah. in the year 2020. So, all right, man, we're at an hour. I think that's going to do it. You got anything else, Chris? No, nah, man, I don't. Appreciate everybody uh, listening and watching today. Yeah, appreciate it, y'all. Appreciate the support as always. By the way, we hit 5,000 subscribers on our YouTube officially. So, appreciate that. If you're watching on YouTube right now or whatever uh, platform you're watching on, please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. And uh, if you're on the uh, podcast, please uh, leave us a review. So, again, hope you all had a great Christmas, great holidays, happy new year, and uh, we will see you on Tuesday afternoon. Appreciate